Hello, and welcome to this Federal Society webinar call. Today, July 5th, 2023, we host a post-decision courthouse steps webinar on SAMIA versus United States. My name is Kayla Kleist, and I'm an assistant director of practice group here at the Federal Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the expert on today's call, as the Federal Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. Now, in the interest of time, I'll keep the introduction brief, but if you'd like to know more about our guest today, you can access his impressive full bio at fedsoc.org. Today, we're fortunate to have with us Robert McBride, who is a partner in charge of the Kentucky office of Taft, Stettenius, and Hollister. Prior to his time there, Mr. McBride was an assistant United States attorney with the Eastern District of Kentucky for over 15 years. As an AUSA, Mr. McBride first chaired criminal jury trials in the U.S. District Court and held appeals before the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Additionally, he was the district's national security prosecutor and anti-terrorism advisory council coordinator. During his tenure as an AUSA, Mr. McBride also held several leadership positions, serving as a manager of the London branch office, criminal chief, and uh, more recently as the supervisor of the Fort Mitchell branch office. Mr. McBride also formerly served the United States Navy's Judge Advocate General Corps for 10 years. Now, I'll leave it there. Um, one last note about the panel. If you have any questions, please submit them via the question and answer feature so we'll access them and get to a portion of today's webinar. With that, thank you all for being with us today. Mr. McBride, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kayla. Uh, thanks for everybody who's listening. We're going to talk today about Sammy versus of the United States. The case implicates confrontation clause issues. And what I'd like to do is start with the question presented, uh, talk about uh, the majority's holding, uh, some of the dissent, um, and uh, also give you a little practicum uh, from my point of view about how you handle these kinds of issues. So let me start with the question presented. And it is whether the Sixth Amendment's Confrontation Clause included the admission at a joint trial of a modified version of a non-testifying co-defendant statement, which did not facially inculpate the petitioner and was accompanied by a limiting instruction that is to be considered only against the co-defendant on the theory that other trial evidence would lead the jury to link the petitioner. So let me talk about the facts to make some of that question presented more clear. So there was a fellow named Paul LaRue, and Paul was the head of a transnational criminal organization. He had a number of activities, drug trafficking, carrying out acts of violence, money laundering, extortion, et cetera. In order to uh, enforce some of his policies, if you will, he would hire individuals and call them his team of mercenaries. Sammy had came to work for LaRue as a mercenary in 2008. And for whatever reason, at some point, he expressed uh, interest working as an assassin for Mr. LaRue. At one point, Mr. LaRue got involved in a real estate transaction with a woman named Catherine Lee. This Lee was a real estate broker in the Philippines. Now, LaRue evidently believed that Miss Lee had cheated her out of some money. So he got three of his guys, uh, Hunter, Stillwell, and Samia, to uh, carry out an execution of Miss Lee, which they did. They went to the Philippines uh, and the, uh, they posed as real estate buyers. Uh, after making contact with her, her body was found in a vacant lot near a pile of gar garbage, and she was shot in the face at close range. These guys remained at large for a little while, uh, but when the indictment was handed down, uh, Samia, Hunter, and Stillwell were charged with conspiracy to murder for hire, murder for hire, conspiracy to murder and kidnap in another country. They went to the Philippines, obviously. Uh, using and carrying a firearm in relationship to a murder and conspiracy to launder money. Before they were charged, Stillwell made a confession and his confession named Samia as having been in the van with him at the time of Lee's execution and that Samia was in fact the executioner uh, who shot Miss Lee. By the time they get to trial, Neither one wants to testify. So Stillwell's confession uh, can still be admitted. And the way it goes is this. 
Stilwell is a non-testifying defendant, wants to protect his right against self-incrimination to the extent he can. So the government tries to enter his confessional statement. But because a confessional statement is testimonial in nature, it falls within the ambit of the confrontation clause. And typically, um, when statements are admitted at this stage in the game, uh, under the jurisprudence before Samia and probably after Samia, these statements are modified or redacted in a way that does not facially implicate the other defendant. And if it's done right at the time the court, the testimony or the report comes in, pardon me, the, the confession comes in, then the judge instructs the jury, you can only consider this for the testimony of Mr. Stilwell and not Mr. Sammy. Then when jury instructions come down, a similar instruction will be read to the jury to remind them not to use the confessional statement against Mr. Samia, but only against Mr. Stilwell. Both gentlemen, of course, convicted, although I think Mr. Stilwell was not convicted of the money laundering. So the case uh, coming out of the Second Circuit goes up to the Supreme Court. Mr. Samia is asking the Supreme Court essentially to get away, to expand Bruton so that statements that do not facially incriminate the other co-defendant, in other words, him, uh, cannot be used uh, at all in court. The government, of course, uh, maintains that the uh, statement was properly brutalized uh, and uh, was it properly admissible. So let me take a step back in these facts. Sometimes when uh, you have a statement or a confession made by a, a defendant, the defendant talks about many other things uh, than just the crime at hand. So you can imagine in this case, Mr. Stilwell may have talked quite a bit about Mr. LaRue or other activities that are not germane to this case. Most law enforcement agencies uh, will video and record these kind, kind of statements. Some will only uh, record them in any rate. In this case, for, for one of these reasons, the DEA agent who uh, took the confession of Mr. Stilwell testified. And prior to the trial, on a motion to eliminate from the government, the DEA agent did not use Mr. Samia's name, but the other person. So that'll be interesting for a point later, but let me talk about the court's analysis. As a preliminary matter, where I think the majority is coming from is this idea, this, this concept based in American jurisprudence that a jury can be trusted to follow the instructions of a court, which I think is what distinguishes the dissent, Justice Kagan and Justice Brown's dissent from the majority opinion. So let me talk about the court's analysis. Um, in general, um, when a non when a non testifying individual's confessional statement is admitted, because it is testimonial, it falls within the ambit of the confrontation clause. But interestingly, the confrontation clause only applies to witnesses against the accused. Under Crawford versus Washington, a co-defendant statement is not considered as against the accused as long as it's properly instructed and that the uh, statement does not facially implicate the other defendant. So along comes this case, you know, Bruton versus the United States. And Bruton carves a narrow exception and says essentially, look, we rely on jurors in order to follow instructions and use their common sense with some level of fidelity to the court. 
However, there are times when confessions, even when instructed and admitted by the court, are so um, obviously inculpating the other defendant that there must be an exception drawn to this trust of the jury, even with an instruction. And so what Bruton says more specifically is this narrow exception and limiting instruction uh, when the statement is so obviously inculpating the other defendant must be uh, scrubbed in some sort of way. It cannot be admitted uh, naming a defendant or uh, so identifying a defendant such that um, it can be admitted, admitted. The narrow exception basically says it's too risky to leave it in the hands of the jury. The next case in this line is Richardson versus March. And it declined to extend Burton to confessions that do not actually name the defendant. Mars and Williams were tried for assault and murder. Williams had confessed. And here the statement was sufficiently brutalized such that the four corners of the statement did not facially or overwhelmingly implicate the co-defendant. The co-defendant was linked to the confession and the crime by other evidence that was extrinsic to the four corners of the statement. Gray versus Maryland comes on and it modifies Bruton a little bit. And basically in, in this case, uh, Two fellows, Bray and Van, ha Van Landingham, were accused of assault and murder. The confession here that was admitted deleted the defendant's name. In fact, used the word deleted instead of the defendant's name. And in this case, the Supreme Court found that, look, you delete the man's name, but there are other accusatory information in this confession that directly points to the defendant. So it falls within the Burton exception that it must be essentially scrubbed in a way that it doesn't facially implicate the defendant. So in this case, um, it's very similar uh, to, it's more similar to Burton and Richard and March, uh, Richardson and March than it is to Bray. And so they, the, the court holds essentially that this statement that was admitted uh, and properly instructed by the court, so as it does not implicate Samia, both at the time the statement was admitted to the DEA agent and at the time of instructing the jury, that it did not violate the confrontation clause. So there are two things I, I'd like to note about this. Um, there's a footnote in the majority opinion that says, the court never opined as to whether a rewriting a confession may serve, serve as a proper method of redaction. I think that's interesting for two reasons. One, here we have a DEA agent testifying about the confession as properly instructed by the court based on the government's motion to eliminate. But could that testimony be considered a rewriting of the statement because this the testimony is going to, of the confession is going to be within the context of the case agent talking about the investigation itself. And second, I think it's an interesting footnote because as I noted earlier, a lot of these kinds of statements are recorded either verbally or on video and audio. So how you might rewrite a statement, um, I think what they're trying to apply here is perhaps you're better off playing the video or the recording instead of somebody summarizing or rewriting a statement. Um, that, Im that implicates a lot of issues as a practical matter, uh, but I think it's a very interesting footnote. I also want to cite my favorite line from the majority opinion, which is, either Bruton, Richardson, nor Gray provides a license to fly spec trial transcripts in search of evidence it could give rise to a collateral inference that a defendant was named in an altered confession. That means, to me at least, that the principle that a jury will follow the instructions of the court, such statement on its face does not implicate the defendant, yet 
goes and discusses the other aspects of the evidence that comes in and arguments uh, is not sufficient to violate the confrontation clause. In other words, you must look at the statement itself or whether it facially uh, inculpates the defendant. The, the reason I think this is important also from the history of the case is, and is that the petitioner argued, look, you know, the government laid out in its opening statement, its theory of the case, and it named Sammy as the shooter, and it described the circumstances. And of course, in the, in the mind of the petitioner, well, of course, that that linked me. But the interesting thing about that is, as every, every trial lawyer knows, opening statements are not evidence. And I think the court expects the jury in that respect to also follow its instructions, noting that opening statements and closing arguments for that matter are not evidence. So I, I think it goes back to the, the same fact. Uh, Justice Barrett does join in the majority but interestingly, um, writes a separate opinion about the historical aspects of the court's decision. So in the briefs of the petitioner in the United States, there's a great deal of discussion about historical precedents supporting their points of view. And here, I think what Justice Barrett is saying, look, you know, there's a conflict among what the historical period really is and the majority takes its favorite section out of that in order to support its uh, opinion. That said, she otherwise wholly joins in the opinion. But I thought it was an interesting grounds on which to uh, write a concurring opinion. Justice Kagan objects or writes a dissent. And I think her dissent is interesting from the point of view that um, she really looks at a more practical aspect um, of how these statements by non-testifying defendants uh, go. Uh, in other words, it's quite obvious from her point of view that a non-testifying defendant's statement will be automatically attributed to the other defendant, regardless of whether it facially implicates them simply because that individual is sitting at the table. I, I think that has sort of an emotionally appealing and practical um, attraction to it. But I, I personally don't believe that, that that follows the law and the confrontation clause. Um, I think it, as I said earlier, I think this is where their emphasis on uh, the historical precedents and the role of the jury differs. Um, you could hear this kind of argument from, from a lot of my colleagues in the defense bar. Well, everybody knows that, that they know this statement must implicate the other guy sitting at the table with me. But our jurisprudence is based on the fact that uh, juries make decisions um, and are not automatons. In fact, one of our core protections is the, the trial by jury. And if you don't trust juries to follow court's instructions, then, then you lose that uh, principle um, of relying on the jury and that constitutional protection, at least at some level. The uh, Justice Kagan also criticizes some of the, the majority's practical applications if they were to follow the petitioner's rule. The majority cites to the fact that um, there's a long history of trying co defendants together. Separate trials would be a burden to the to the government, and that there is an interest in trying co defendants together so that both defendants get the same shot at the same uh, the same evidence, um, because serial trials you're going to have a transcript of one, and so on may may create factual differences. It may be unfair to one or both defendants. And then third, that if, if we uh, go through extensive burdenizing, in other words, looking outside the document to the whole of the evidence of the government, that's going to 
take a lot of time away from from courts. Now, one point Justice Kagan makes that I think is sensible, not to say her others aren't, but sensible from my point of view as a practitioner is this. You know, she says that, and, and frankly cites Burton, says, you know, this administrative task of having to burdenize a document should not get in the way of the fair administration of justice. And if you think about it, trial courts are there for the very purpose of making sure that evidence is admitted according to the rules and the Constitution and that, the, and that they are not um, being used uh, by one side or the other unfairly. So I, I think that's a fair criticism Justice Kagan makes of the majority's opinion. Justice uh, Jackson also um, files a dissenting opinion while joining with Justice Kagan, as does just Justice Sotomayor. Justice Brown, pardon me, Justice Jackson's focus really seems to be more on uh, that Bruton uh, and his progeny, and particularly Samia, sort of turns the Constitution on its head, where the the primary right ought to be the right of con confrontation, which is, of course, to cross-examine, hear the testimony of in live court, and cross-examine the, the witnesses against you. I guess that's really, in my eyes, an attack on Crawford, because Crawford says if the statement um, is inculpatory to the one, it's not inculpatory to the other defendant. And so it falls outside the ambit of um, the confrontation clause. So um, in all, I think for practitioners, uh, particularly for the government, this won't, this case, Samia, will not change the way things happen as a practical matter. Generally, what happens is there's a motion in limine by the government when they've got a uh, confession, a Mirandized confession that they want to put in. And they submit what they call a brutalized version of it. I spent many hours uh, both doing them myself and as a supervisory AUSA, making sure that it meets the requirements of brute uh, and grain for that matter. We then would submit it to the judge, and the judge would review it um, and you know either approve it, make modifications, say go back and do it again. But it's all completed before a trial is started. So from the point of view of the government, I don't think it will particularly change their practice. From the point of view of the defense, I think it puts to rest some ambiguity with regard to Gray and how far a court should look in evaluating whether or not um, a brutalized statement is appropriate. By that, I mean looking beyond the four corners of the document and evaluating what other evidence that may be out there. This is a position, of course, that Samia uh, proposed. Um, and so it, it's going to make that more difficult, I think, from a defense point of view. Now, there remains, you know, all the other issues of relevance, et cetera, if you can use those. Um, and the accuracy of the statement, um, I think, is also important from a defense point of view. How an agent might testify. Um, may vary the discovery that may vary significantly from the discovery that um, defense has. And I think there's something that they have to be wary of. If they can participate with the government in the Bruton process, some prosecutors will, most will not do that. Um, it might be useful, but I think a lot of the litigation in this area is uh, from the defense is going to be um, truncated by this uh, decision. I would welcome questions from the audience. Or you, Kayla. I was going to say, uh, thank you so much for that background and the breakdown of the decision, as well as some of the, the facts that uh, shape this case. Um, we are now moving to the Q&A. So audience, if you would like to submit questions, please feel free to do so by the Q&A feature. Uh, but I do have a couple of my own that I'd love to pose as the audience is submitting those. Um, you've mentioned some of the precedent that is implicated by this case, uh, Bruton, Crawford, et cetera. Uh, does this decision constitute a notable change in Sixth Amendment press jurisprudence? Excuse me. And if so, what cases does it undermine, overturn, or uh, bring to the fore? Well, I don't think it really 
provides a, a strong departure. What I think it does is truncate the ability of defendants to continue to argue that a burdenized statement uh, it does implicate their uh, defendant based on things other than the uh, other than the the statement itself. So Gray is taken very often as, look, you know, uh, Gray was modified in a way so that it was not uh, facially inculpating of the defendant based on the circumstances. So I, I do think that Gray has not been overturned. But I think the focus now has to be on the content of the document, not so much whatever else is out there. So I still think the defendants have to be very leery about how the statement is structured and whether within the four corners of the document, the statement is going to be inculpatory or overly inculpatory of the not of the other co-defendant. Does that make any sense? Yes. Yeah. I'd Following up on this and sort of the effect this case may have, um, does the fact that it's a split opinion, so it's 6-3, but it's five who joined fully and then Justice Barrett who joined almost fully, um, have any, does the fact it's split in that way, have any effect on the way those arguments will be treated moving forward or possibly have any effect on those arguments will be treated moving forward? Or is the fact that five justices, a true majority, agreed to this uh, opinion perhaps solidify and clarify that this is um, the, the keystone on which arguments moving forward should be built? Well, I don't think as far as, you know, the weight of the opinion, Justice Barrett's, my personal opinion is Justice Barrett's um, opinion does not undermine the, the precedent of the case. It simply um, questions sort of the historical precedent um, on which the court relies to sort of, in my view, sort of cherry picking that. But I don't think that that really changes uh, too much about the jurisprudence. I think I think that it's a it's a bit cautionary about let's make sure that what we're relying on is complete because there was always conflicting information in, in the original uh, in the original record of either word, the historical record. So I don't think that that undermines it. Um, you know, both Justice uh, Kagan and Justice Jackson explicitly stated they think that this is uh, one step in the majority's rolling back of Bruton um, so that confessional statements that actually name uh, the other uh, co-defendant will be uh, admissible under the Confrontation Clause and Crawford. Um, the, the hypotheticals that Justice Kagan uses uh, in her opinion, I think set forth a way in which defendants could continue to challenge Bruton. Um, but I don't know that given the long line of cases from Crawford to Gray and now this case, that, that that's not gonna be anything other than an uphill battle. I, I don't see this, of course I'm way on the outside, I don't really see this as an attempt to undermine Burton. What I see it as is, is a logical and practical application of the of the jurisprudence that's come along in this area. Got it. Uh, continuing on that thought of Justice Barrett choosing to have a difference in her argumentation, saying, hey, maybe the history uh, that the majority is using isn't uh, what she would support. Uh, are there arguments or questions you were surprised to see raised in the opinions? And I'll, I'll ask the opposite. Uh, were there arguments or questions that you were surprised not to see up here, um, either in the majority concurrence or either dissent? Well, I think in the majority opinion, they didn't talk uh, to a great degree about um, the relationship between evidence outside the confessional statement that would implicate an individual versus the statement itself. Um, and I understand that because um, it may be difficult to quantify that. On the other hand, um, it, you know, with the fly spec comment that, that I noted, it might have been useful to express that a little bit more, at least from the practitioner's point of view. 
um, way down here at the trial level, these things filter through a lot of a lot of things, and and so it's helpful to have that kind of director because now, at least in my circuit, the Sixth Circuit's going to have to take a look at some of these issues and hand it down to the district court judges. And at least in my experience, there's a, a delay in the trickle down. Um, I was I was very surprised actually to see the statements by Justice Kagan and Justice Jackson about. We believe this is a step in, in overturning the, the burden. Um, I don't know if they're mad at each other or what, um, but I didn't see it particularly, in my view, my limited view, I didn't see them particularly well supported by their following arguments. They almost seem to me like just flat statements. Um, and then they went on to make their substantive arguments, which from from you know, we're certainly logical and, and make sense from the point of view that that you know, those justices are, are viewing the Constitution in this, this case. Um, does that answer the question? Yes. Yeah, I appreciate it. Both the, hey, here's what I was surprised to see and not see. That's always interesting. Um, you've mentioned that you don't expect it to be significant. It doesn't seem to be a departure precedent in your view. It also doesn't seem like it will change much as regards joint trials or jury instructions. Uh, but are there downstream effects uh, and industries or areas of law that should be paying attention to the possible indirect effects of this decision? Um, I think there was an ethical component here, particularly for prosecutors. Um, I think that prosecutors must be careful uh, in these circumstances to look not only at um, you know, whether the defendant is named, but also whether the context of the entirety of the um, confessional statement in some other way identifies the defendant. So if the, just hypothetically, if it says the other guy with the white beard, you know, that may too much identify, you know, the other co-defendant. Or if it was, you know, the guy I joined the LaRue um, the LaRue organization with in 2008, um, who was on this, you know, event with me, there can be circumstances in which that that could be too much. And so also with regard to um, agents, if you're going to have an agent testify about it, and I'm not disparaging any agents uh, at all, but they're not lawyers. And so I think prosecutors have to make sure that the, the agents have a, a very solid understanding of what they can say and how they can't say, because you have to remember these agents are going to be subject to cross-examination. And so I, I, you know, agents, there are literally agents of the prosecutor and prosecutors and lawyers can be held responsible for what agents say um, uh, to some extent. So I think prosecutors and, and supervisors need to be very well aware that this it's not a license to walk up to the line uh, and identify somebody without saying their name. Um, and as for defense lawyers, I think they have an obligation to make sure that as the testimony comes out, and if they can before that, um, make sure that what is coming out comports in substance with what the other defendant is saying. So very often, you know, if you're a defense lawyer, maybe you want to file a motion to eliminate on your co-defendant's um, testimony to get it properly brutalized and get yourself to the table. Um, for, you know, people who are, um, I, I mean, this can cover all kinds of, of subject matter areas. You can see it arising in crimes involving businesses, crimes involving overseas businesses, I mean, functionally, LaRue is running a business. It just happened to be criminal. So you also see how, you know, the reach of the federal government um, is really worldwide. So I, I think there are ethical issues here. I think there are practical issues. I think the more co-defendants you have at the table, maybe the easier it is to brutalize a statement. If you've just got two co-defendants, you know, that could implicate, you know, something more. Got it. Well, on that note, and as a last question, barring any from our audience, uh, now that we have the decision, you've mentioned that there are, are questions that may remain as it trickles down. Uh, what are those questions that remain unanswered post uh, Samia? Well, I, I think that the question is whether or not uh, 
judges have fully embraced SAMIA and whether defense counsel have fully embraced SAMIA. I mean, it's a very practical, from a trial lawyer's point of view, it's a very practical evolution. You know, the statement is made, it has to be scrutinized in an appropriate way. And the mechanics of that is, is particularly sometimes to a judge, but clearly through generally a motion and limiting. Um, so I think that you may have a lot of arguments that remain that are more like gray arguments uh, that, that haven't quite trickled down that judges may still continue to, to consider. I'm not saying they shouldn't, I'm just saying that it'll be, I think it'll become less frequent over time. Got it. Well, thank you so much. Um, seeing no questions, I'll give everybody back some of their afternoons and we can wrap it here on behalf of the Federal Society. Thank you so much, Ms. McBride. I really appreciate you giving us part of your afternoon and sharing your valuable time and expertise. Thank you to our audience for joining and participating. We welcome listener feedback by email info at fed-stock.org. And as always, please keep an eye on our website and your email for announcements about other upcoming virtual events. With that, thank you all for joining us today. We are adjourned.